We now move on to the next item of business, which is topical questions. Question one, Neil Finlay. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the reported decline in the number of college students. Cabinet Secretary Michael Russell. Presiding officer, the latest figures in the Scottish Funding Council tell a positive story of what is being achieved in our colleges. We've exceeded our commitment to maintain full-time equivalent student numbers. Retention and attainment are increasing. There are record numbers of 16 to 24-year-olds undertaking full-time, economically relevant courses that will significantly enhance their employment prospects. These are important indicators of what we are building in the college sector. Focused provision leading to improved attainment and creating better life chances. These achievements should not be obscured by a fixation on headcount. I have explained on many occasions that headcount is a volatile measure which fails to take any account of the intensity and economic importance of provision. I shall shortly make clear my priorities for the additional £10 million of investment for academic year 2013-14. Thank you. Neil Finlay. Surely even by the Cabinet Secretary's definition, 120,000 can't be explained away by volatility. Uh, or does he accept or does he uh, think that this 120,000 fewer students is just another false concept? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have been at pains to try and explain to Mr Finlay the concept of, of headcount. The fact that headcount uh, of the type that he is referring to does not reflect what is taking place in colleges. It compares unlike with unlike. It takes very short courses of limited economic relevance and lists them in exactly the same way as it would list courses, full-time courses of economic relevance. And if um, Mr Finney would care to drill into the figures that, were, uh, that have been published, he would see some interesting details. For example, the average hours of learning per student increased by 12% in the last year and by 36% since 2006-07 reflecting the decline in very short programmes and an increase in students studying towards more substantial qualifications. This indicates that the experience, the student experience, is one which is producing employability as the main issue, and that will inevitably produce a decline in certain types of short courses and a stability in terms of overall numbers, and that's what we've seen. Thank you. Mr Finlay? The fact is that there is no increase in learning for the 120,000 uh, students who are no longer in a college. And does the Cabinet Secretary accept that women, adult returners and students with learning disabilities are disproportionately affected in this 120,000 figure? Cabinet Secretary. I have to say there is no figure of 120,000 students who are, and I use Mr Finlay's words, no longer in college. Uh, many of those the, the numbers reflect individuals who are now doing longer courses. Now, go back to this point. To compare a short course of the type we're talking about with a full-time or, or largely full-time course that leads to employability is comparing two things that are unlike. Mr. Finlay raises an important issue about those who are furthest from employment and furthest from learning. And the purpose of reform is to try and make sure that everybody is brought closer to employment as a result of involvement in the college system. That is what's taking place, and where there is need for particular effort in terms of the uh, reforms taking place, for example, with those who have learning difficulties, we have worked with and are working with key organisations in that regard. And I have discussed with colleges the way in which the money is being made available now will focus on some of those groups. But this is an intention, and has been the intention of reform, to produce, make employability the key issue. And I'm glad that's been welcomed by College of Scotland in their response to these figures. Thank you. Elizabeth Smith. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, in the post-16 bill, it states that uh, education provision will be more responsive to the needs of learners and employers. And uh, colleges and employers have made the point that there is increasing scope for part-time courses uh, particularly on a local delivery. How does that square with the uh, figures that were announced last week? Cabinet Secretary. It, it squares very well with, with that. I, I visit colleges on many occasions. Indeed, I've been in three colleges in the last eight days. <coughs> I meet with students, I meet with staff, I meet with employers. And everywhere I go, there is a focus on making sure that learning is appropriate, and it is the regional nature of provision that will allow that uh, to be undertaken. Now, there is variety in that delivery, but all the employers I meet recognize that the changes we're making will produce a, that greater emphasis on employability, and they welcome that. 
And I'd be very happy if, if, the, if the member wants to come with me on college visits and to meet some of those employers, then she will see at first hand that the changes are the very things that employers need. Thank you. Liam MacArthur. Thank you very much, Deputy President Officer. Um, when I published the results of an FOI request last month, it suggested that a loss over the last three years of 85,000 part-time places. Uh, I was, uh, it was suggested by uh, the Cabinet Secretary's sp spokesperson that I should catch up with the real figures. Now that the Cabinet Secretary's own figures have not only caught up but now exceeded uh, the figures I published, what assurances can he give that the part-time places that were particularly valuable, uh, valuable to women learners, adult learners and others uh, are not uh, resulting in a de decreased opportunities uh, for those groups in particular? Cabinet Secretary. There is still a very substantial number of part-time opportunities available. I think the suggestion that Mr McCarthy should catch up probably refers uh, largely to the reforms that are taking place and the positive benefits of reforms. And if uh, Mr McCarthy was to care and if Mr. MacArthur would care to look at the full detail of the figures that were published last week, he would recognise that, for example, college performance indicators are improving year on year. In 11-12, 64% of full-time students studying for a recognised FE. I'm sorry that Mr. Scott, presiding officer, does not want to listen to these figures. They are important to college learners. They are important to Scotland. They are important in terms of the improvements that are taking place. 64% of full-time students studying for a recognised FE qualification successfully completed the course, an increase from 62%. 69% of full-time students studying for a recognised HE qualification completed the course, an increase from 67%. 67% of 16- to 19-year-olds successfully completed the course, an increase in 64%. 68% of 20- to 24-year-olds successfully completed the course, an increase from 67%. There is a... I'm also very sorry that Mr Scott still doesn't want to listen to these, because these are important facts in the changes that are taking place that improve college education year on year. If, unfortunately, the Liberal Democrats do not wish to listen to these improvements, then it will be fated, as they have been fated in almost every debate in this Parliament, to be in the tiny minority of people who would change, who would prioritise good things in Scotland, and the electoral tide will overwhelm them yet again. Thank you very much. I now call on Hugh Henry. Mr Henry. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Will the Cabinet Secretary give any assistance to those students with learning disabilities who are no longer able to access courses at local colleges? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have answered on a number of occasions that question for Mr Henry and his colleagues, and I answer again in the same way. I've met with the organisations which are concerned with these students. I've asked those organisations to come forward with proposals. I'm meeting those organisations again shortly. I am very keen that we put those proposals into place, and I discuss that issue on a regular basis when I meet colleges. And in addition, I hope that the outcome agreements can encompass those issues. All of those are answers I've given before. All of those are things that are actually happening. All of those express the concerns we have that the entirety of those served by colleges are well served. Many hey, thanks. Now move to question two. John Wilson. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions it has held with Scottish Water regarding the decisions to curtail the activities of Scottish Water Horizons. Government Secretary Nicholas Sturgeon. Scottish Water has notified the uh, Government of the decision draw from green waste composting activities. Scottish Water has reviewed the business focus of its Horizon subsidiary and has decided to focus more fully on its renewable energy portfolio where it considers it can achieve better returns on investment. While no longer accepting green waste into deer dikes, the food waste recycling operation will remain operational and continue to make a major contribution to our zero waste and renewable energy ambitions. Employees affected by these changes will be transferred to other roles, either at Deer Dykes or elsewhere within Scottish Water. Renewable energy remains a key priority, and Scottish Water will continue to focus upon wind, hydro and food waste projects. Thank you. John Wilson. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for the response. Could the Cabinet Secretary outline what the full impact on the Deer Dykes site in Cumbernauld would be, and the... the Cabinet Secretary agree the decision raises a number of issues with regards to the implementation of contracts entered into with local authorities in the immediate area regarding green waste. Cabinet Secretary. Um, in terms of the impact in deer dikes, as I say, although the uh, composting uh, activities uh, will cease, uh, the food recycling activity will continue at deer dikes. I understand that all uh, contracts uh, will be 
uh, honoured uh, until contracts expire in uh, 2014. All existing customer contracts will be honoured until those expiry dates. As I said in my initial answer, uh, employees affected by these changes will be transferred to other roles. Some of them will be transferred to other roles within Deer Dykes, others to other roles uh, within the wider Scottish water operation. I should stress um, in conclusion, Presiding Officer, that none of this uh, undermines at all the ambition uh, that Scottish Water has around uh, renewable energy. In fact, just yesterday I had the opportunity to visit a very exciting new Scottish Water Hydro initiative where a, a particular turbine uh, will produce enough electricity to power 150 homes. That was in uh, Denny. So Scottish Water is very focused on making sure that it is meeting its renewables uh, obligations and, and doing so in a way that delivers uh, the highest possible return. Okay, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank once again the uh, Cabinet Secretary for that response and the assurances in terms of climate change targets both for the Scottish Government and Scottish Water. Could the Cabinet Secretary give any indications whether or not there are in, any discussions regarding other subsidiaries of Scottish Water and their future uh, operation? None uh, that I think are particularly relevant to this question, but I'm more than happy to ask uh, Scottish Water if uh, John Wilson would be interested to meet with him and to discuss uh, these issues in more detail. I, uh, when I visited Denny to uh, launch the project that I've just spoken about yesterday, uh, had the opportunity to uh, meet with both the Chair and Chief Executive of Scottish Water, uh, and I was impressed then, as I have been in the past, about their commitment uh, to renewable energy projects uh, to make sure that, as well as delivering the high-quality uh, customer services that Scottish Water provides that it is also doing its bit to reduce its own uh, environmental footprint to uh, help contribute towards uh, carbon emissions targets and to play its wider role in our environmental objectives. But I'm sure any member who wants to discuss that with them in more detail uh, would find them uh, very willing to do so. Many thanks. Richard Baker. Thank you. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe it is reasonable for Scottish Water Horizons not to publish details of the review it carried out of its waste business before reaching this very significant decision? Well, I'm more than happy to discuss with Scottish Water uh, provision of information, and as I said to John Wilson, I'm sure they'd be happy to discuss this issue in more detail with any member. Uh, Scottish Water, uh, and uh, in terms of uh, Scottish Horizons, have uh, looked at this very much from a, a business focus and decided that it uh, is better for them to more uh, fully focus on the renewable energy portfolio because they consider that will deliver uh, a better return. And of course, it is important to uh, point out again, as I know members are aware, that Scottish Water customers are fully protected from the impact of any activities carried out uh, by the Horizon subsidiary. So uh, I think Scottish Water is right to take uh, these decisions in the way uh, that it has and on the basis that it has, but I'm sure it would be happy to further discuss the reasons underpinning these uh, decisions with any member who is so interested. Many thanks. And that concludes. Our